Hello all and welcome to Stingray Toms, Florida and another deeper dive into the archive. Today I'm in Jacksonville's Memorial Park on the St. Johns River. This park was created in 1919 and is on the National Register of Historic Places. Memorial Park is in one of the most historic neighborhoods in Jacksonville and I'm here today to introduce a biography video. This one is of a Jacksonville native who contributed in unique and valuable ways to Florida's tourism industry, especially in the era before World War II. It's a story that hasn't really been told before, especially in the context of tourism. My subject today is Carita Doggett Course, one of Florida's most important writers and historians. Enjoy. There's two things I want to mention before I get into the video. Firstly is that I'll be referring to Carita by her first name. This isn't done out of a lack of professional respect or even out of familiarity. It's simply a convenience because, of course, course can be confusing. Secondly, considering Carita's importance as an author, I have included several excerpts from her books and a speech. Every good writer has a style, a voice, if you will. No recordings of Carita exist, as far as I know, so I asked Jessa Halterman to be Carita's voice. Jessa is a talented professional actress. I'll share her contact information in the description. I came to learn about this important Floridian over many years. Sometime in the late 1980s, I found this souvenir booklet in a used bookstore. Its title is The Historical Romance of Florida's Silver Springs, Shrine of the Water Gods, and Carita is listed as the author. It's a booklet for Silver Springs, arguably Florida's oldest running tourist attraction. I'll get into the booklet later, as it has a fascinating story in itself. The name Carita Doggett Course didn't stand out, though giving an author credit in a souvenir booklet is pretty unusual. A few years later, I ran across another booklet, this time for St. Augustine's Fountain of Youth attraction, also one of the oldest in the state. It's subtitled Ancient Indian Village and Burial Grounds, and it's also ascribed to Krita. At the time, I didn't make any connection. In fact, it wasn't until much later when I was doing research on one of Florida's most significant authors, Zora Neale Hurston, that I once again ran across the name Carita Doggett Course. I suppose third time is the charm, as that's when the story began to emerge. The first reading is an excerpt from an address delivered to the Florida Historical Society at its 1927 annual meeting entitled, Florida History, A Field of Colorful Original Sources. If you were to read the complete history of Florida, you would probably enjoy it as a wonderful story almost too dramatic to be true. But if you set yourself the task of writing an account of any part of that long struggle between four nations, you would find yourself a very active person. Selecting, arranging, and presenting an untried mass of fiery and illuminating material. And the sooner you went to those original sources of information, the state documents, voluminous reports, the illustrated maps, and eloquent letters of the old Spanish, French, English, and American official records, the greater would be your chance of contributing a living chapter to a very lonely field of historical effort. Only recently has the would-be writer of Florida history been able to benefit by the original documents of these periods. After tracing our course on the picturesque maps, with their frescoes of mermaids, dolphins, classic maidens, and noble natives, you will find an indescribable aura of the real moving story rising about you, and you may be able to write it, fresh and unspoiled by any other hand. At this point in her career, the 36-year-old historian had already published several articles and a book, Dr. Andrew Turnbull and the New Smyrna Colony of Florida which was published in 1919. 
Considered a successful historian and writer, Carita stood out as someone rather different in the field. Born in 1891, the Jacksonville native wasn't a typical young female Floridian. While Carita's grandfather, Aristides Doggett, served the Confederacy as a captain in the 3rd Florida Infantry, she and her family weren't really Southern in any conventional sense. I'm near Carita's grave in Jacksonville's historic Evergreen Cemetery. Her husband, Montgomery Corse, and two sons, Herbert and John, lie here as well. But it's only one of three of Jacksonville cemeteries in which the relatives of Carita are buried. Carita's ancestors were some of the earliest to move into Florida after the U.S. took possession of it in 1821. And soon after, they helped to found Jacksonville. Carita's great-grandfather was Judge John Locke Doggett. Born in Massachusetts in 1798, Doggett and his wife Maria Fairbanks are buried in the nearby old Jacksonville Cemetery. Doggett wasn't just a territorial judge, he was also a postmaster and the operator of a ferry boat which traveled from the north side of St. John's southward to connect with the road to St. Augustine. Carita's great-grandparents were from Massachusetts, the judge having been educated at Rhode Island's Brown University. Carita's great-great-grandfather was even an Episcopal minister. Like her relatives, Carita was educated at northern institutions, attending Vassar and getting her master's at Columbia. She was also active in women's rights, eventually becoming the first director of Florida's chapter of Planned Parenthood, as well as an early supporter of women's suffrage. So while she was a native to Jacksonville, her familial connections were much more tied to New England. It's not surprising that her first book was about the Scottish physician, Dr. Andrew Turnbull, as he is also considered to be one of her ancestors. Turnbull was the head of the early colony of New Smyrna. Established in 1768 during the 20-year British control of Florida and comprised of mostly Catalans from Spain and Southern Greeks, the colony was created to grow hemp, sugarcane, and indigo. As Carita wrote in Dr. Andrew Turnbull and the New Smyrna Colony of Florida. Reminders of Turnbull are plentiful throughout the state. On the palm-covered banks of the North Indian River stands New Smyrna itself, named for Smyrna, Asia Minor, the birthplace of Turnbull's wife. The pretty modern town is threaded with the main canals of the old colony and water still runs through them in a musical monotone from Turnbull's great hammock lands to the river. Every year, a large winter colony returns to picturesque homes and groves, and the new colonists spend many pleasant hours speculating over the works of their predecessors. The lovely arches of the old mission, many stone wells, and the heavy foundation of the fort. Then, the Turnbull family has continued to be prominent in Florida, and the dark-eyed descendants of those Menorcans who came with him to New Smyrna 150 years ago now live in St. Augustine and hand down among themselves lurid traditions of the old colony. For this book, only documentary evidence has been relied upon. No statements from secondary sources of information have been accepted without careful verification, and copies of all the original manuscript have been collected and filed with the Florida Historical Society. In the latter half of the 20th century, historians strove to keep their writings interesting to the general public without the romanticism that was so prevalent in the 20s and 30s. But for Carita and her contemporaries, the format of painting a lush and dramatic picture of historic scenes was how it was done. As Carita noted, her work was researched and verified, so while romantic in tone, the book was historically accurate, at least for a hundred plus years ago. This brings me back to the first work of hers I read, Shrine of the Water Gods. I found the edition along with several other Silver Spring documents that provided a date of publication of 1956. Subsequently, I learned that the booklet had been reprinted multiple times and its initial publication was over 20 years earlier, in 1935. There are six different editions in the archive, with the 1956 copy being the most recent. 
Karita's text for the 1935 edition of Shrine of the Water Gods is identical to each later edition, though a new section was added eventually to cover newer attractions. There are also dramatic changes to the images, as can be seen here, with wonderful simple drawings gracing the first edition with different drawings and photographs added in subsequent reprints. That's why it's so helpful to have each edition. I found the text very interesting when I first read it, though I was struck by the romantic style, something I wasn't all that familiar with in historical writings. Still, Carita told a compelling story, one that I hope to share more fully in a future video. The booklet tells of the story of Silver Springs from its prehistoric role in the lives of the indigenous communities that lived in the area, to the Spanish exploration and its eventual development into an attraction. The value of Silver Springs as a tourist attraction was appreciated by Americans at a very early date. Only a month before Florida became a state, James Rogers bought from the United States the 80 acres surrounding Silver Springs, paying $1.25 an acre. The improvements at the springs have steadily increased and are now valued at a million dollars. Silver Springs is perhaps the most successful and elaborately developed single tourist attraction in America today, deservedly famous abroad as well as in this country. Across the water is a tract that has been left untouched. Here all the wildflowers, ferns, jungle creepers, and tangled growth of a Florida forest flourish just as they did hundreds of years ago. At the head of the Great Springs is the pavilion, where trips on glass bottom boats may be had. From the shores of the spring, the transparency and depth of the water cannot be fully realized. Only through the glass bottom of one of these peculiar constructed boats can one realize its crystal clearness. Once afloat, peering down at the bottom, one gets the effect of riding high aloft on some magic carpet, sliding along smoothly and silently over a vast valley. The soft pastel colors seen in the depths are caused by the reflection of rays of light which easily penetrate the clear water to the bottom where bits of limestone and shell act as natural prisms and break the white light into all of the colors of the rainbow. Carita goes on to acknowledge the first English-speaking explorer to visit the area, who wrote about its wonders and how it influenced some of Britain's most important writers. A Philadelphia botanist, William Bartram, visited Florida in 1774 and wrote his adventures in a travel book which exerted a widespread and powerful literary influence in Europe. His descriptions of the carefree Indian life enraptured William Wordsworth, whose notes are full of seminoles and alligators. The imagination of Samuel Taylor Coleridge was captured by Bartram's description of the underground rivers, great springs and sinkholes of the Ocala region, whose waters appeared from such mysterious sources. The result colored the poem Kublai Khan, where Alp, the sacred river, ran through caves measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. Like all travelers among the Indians, Bartram was deeply impressed with the strict adherence to religious ceremony. His observations bear out the testimony of others as to the great similarity of Indian beliefs all over the country. Coincidentally, the first edition of Shrine of the Water Gods was published the same year that Carita took a job that would have significant impact on her life as well as Florida and the writing of nonfiction and fiction for the next decade. As I mentioned in my video, A Brief History of Florida Tourism, the first important era for tourism began in the 1890s. Known as the Gilded Age, it's when Henry Flagler provided the means for the country's ultra-rich to winter in lavishly appointed resorts in St. Augustine and Palm Beach. While that era was driven by wealth, ironically, the Second Great Era was driven by poverty. Happening during the Great Depression, which gripped the nation throughout the 1930s, this time it was the federal government that provided the means for tourism development. Due to the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his plans to pull the U.S. out of the Depression, a great deal of federal funds were spent in Florida in different programs to provide needed work. One such program was the Federal Writers Project. Developed in 1935, 
Overall director Dr. Henry Ellsberg hired Carita to be the Florida director, one of 48 that represented each state. It was a position she would keep until 1942 when the program was shut down at the outbreak of World War II. Carita was responsible for hiring every writer, 90% of which were required to come from welfare roles. In a state with a relatively small population and one that was almost entirely rural, finding experienced writers was impossible. Part of Carita's success in the position was to find people who she and other writers could train and develop as professionals. The project would utilize not only writers, but librarians and historians who were tasked with collecting the history and folklore of the Sunshine State. Working with writers such as Stetson Kennedy, Carita would travel around the state collecting some of the information herself. Kennedy, who deserves his own video, helped Carita understand that the stories of Florida black communities needed to be collected as well. The work included the stories of formerly enslaved individuals, most of whom were over 80 years old. While so many Florida slave narratives were never collected, it's due to Carita and her staff that we have as many as we do. During the midst of the Depression and her work with the Florida Writers Project, Carita wrote the text for her second souvenir booklet, The Fountain of Youth. It appeared for the first time in 1937. It too was reprinted several times, as can be seen from these three editions, each of which keep Carita's text unchanged. Three years after the close of the Civil War, an English florist, H. H. Williams, became owner of the Fountain of Youth property. On these historic grounds, he developed a beautiful orange grove. Records of people drinking from the spring exist from as early as 1868, the number increasing during the 90s. Northern tourists had discovered St. Augustine at this time by a journey fraught with hardships. The visitor took a boat from Charleston to Piccolata on the St. John's River, where he climbed into a strange coach in which he joggled and swayed for many weary hours through the Pine Barrens. A charming haze of antiquity over the narrow streets, scarcely wide enough for a carriage, the wind-bent cedars, the ancient oaks with trunks as gray as the broken old wall surrounding the little Spanish gardens, and the sunny peacefulness dominated by the grim fort looking from its centuries toward the sea soon enclosed the traveler in another world as it does today. During the Depression, Carita not only continued to produce her own historical works, she developed various projects for the Florida Writers Project. Considering her work on women's suffrage, it's perhaps not surprising that she was one of the most forward-looking directors in the federal project. As deeply entrenched as Florida was in the traditions of the Old South, Carita insisted that the staff collect folk history from everyone, regardless of ethnicity. This included the music, folk tales, superstitions, and dances from Florida communities, including Arabic, Bahamian, Cuban, Greek, Italian, Menorcan, and Seminole. The project would also create a Negro Writers Unit to hire black writers and researchers, one of only three established in a southern state. While there were many black individuals who participated, the most famous was the writer and historian Zora Neale Hurston. And yes, Zora deserves her own video. Zora joined the Florida Writers Project and began as a field worker who interviewed dozens of individuals from all walks of life. Within four years of the program's inception, the Florida Writers Project published a huge publication titled Florida, A Guide to the Southernmost State. The 600-page guide was a remarkable overview of the work of 400 individuals, some of whom had never done that type of work before being hired by Carita. Once the Florida guide was completed by Carita's staff, possibly the biggest task still lay ahead. The book had to be approved by program editors in Washington, D.C. that were under political scrutiny. By 1939, Roosevelt's influence had weakened, and it was possible that the guide would be significantly censored. Carita appeared to understand the politics as she had two staff members travel with the guide. 
Luckily, the Florida Writers Project avoided the worst of the political attacks, in part because there were fewer political radicals to cause problems. Indeed, it appears the main objections were for the project itself, and not the guide. It's been said that Florida Catholics didn't like the idea of a woman director. Plus, at a time of rising tensions with Germany, the fact that ethnic Germans were part of the project was objected to. Florida, a guide to the southernmost state, included information about art and architecture, transportation, folklore, industry, agriculture, and cultural achievements. It also doesn't have the feeling of being simply a promotional book created by the Florida Chamber of Commerce or Legislature. Corita produced one other major history book during the Depression. Key to the Golden Islands was first published in 1931. The book tells the history of Fort George Island, where the St. John's River empties into the Atlantic. Where the St. John's River ends its long, lazy journey to the sea lies an ancient island. Backed by the inland waterway and pushing a snowy wedge of sand dunes between the blue waters of Fort George Inlet and the river. A great grove of oaks and palms shelters Fort George Island and glimpses of the bright world of beaches, river, and ocean beyond it are framed by the jealous forest, where the strong sea winds rattle the fronds of the palms and blows through the muffled oaks, now softly, now frantically, until it seems as of the vaulted green island were filled with a thousand voices, all striving to tell their very tales so long forgotten. For centuries, its strategic situation made the possession of Fort George Island a decisive point in the struggles of Europeans for the South Atlantic coast, for in the days when waterways were our main arteries of travel, it lay at the entrance to Florida, a high bit of land commanding the mouth of a river which is navigable for hundreds of miles, and the inland passage which offered a sheltered water route. The Timucua Indians who lived on Fort George Island called it Alamakani, which seems, by comparison with other translated Timucua words, to mean sweet land by the sea. Along this coast from Charleston to the St. John's River extends a chain of similar sea islands known to the Spaniards as the Golden Islands. Fort George, because of its strategic position, richly earned its title as the key to this chain and to Florida. Corita successfully combined historical research with an ability to describe Florida's heritage for a lay audience. Although her writing had a significantly romantic style, she was still willing to look into the prehistory of Florida and was one of the earliest writers to put into print the stories of the indigenous tribes including the Calusa, Apalachee, Tequesta, and Timucua. She also explored the earliest Europeans who colonized the peninsula, including the French with Fort Caroline, the Spanish at St. Augustine, and the British at New Smyrna. Corita would pass away in 1978, the same year she was officially recognized by the Florida Historical Society for her work in history and especially her ability to present it to the average person. Nearly two decades after her death, she was honored once more, this time by being inducted into the Florida Women's Hall of Fame. While her works covered the general history of Florida, it was her look at the state's tourism history that was the most popular. Publication records for the booklets on Silver Springs and the Fountain of Youth aren't available, but considering the popularity of both attractions and the longevity of the booklets, it's safe to say that many thousands of copies were sold, especially since the Silver Springs one continued to be printed well into the golden age of Florida tourism. There's little doubt but the Corita Doggett course made a significant impact on Florida tourism history. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please hit the like button and subscribe to learn more about Florida's tourism history. Remember, subscribing is completely free. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.